Um, welcome everyone. I am Charlotte Trowbridge and I work with the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. And I'm really happy to welcome you all to tonight's session of Soil School. Um, tonight we're talking about biochar. And uh, Soil School is a session that, or a series of presentations that we are hosting with our partner, the West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. And if you are not familiar with what conservation districts do, um, we are a local unit of government, um, exist in pretty much every county in the US, and we um, aim to help residents with conservation practices and, and natural resource concerns. So the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District serves Washington County, Oregon, um, and we work with residents by providing them with educational opportunities like this one, um, advice about natural resource conservation, and also financial assistance for conservation projects. Um, and then our partners, West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District, their mission is to provide resources, information, and expertise to inspire people to actively improve air and water quality, fish and wildlife habitat, and soil health. So they are serving residents of Western Multnomah County, um, including Savi Island and a portion of the Bonnie Slope neighborhood. And they do conservation planning, weed management, um, native plantings, habitat restoration, and school garden work. So if you are someone who's from outside Washington or Multnomah County, we encourage you to look up your county's soil and water conservation district and connect with them. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. We are recording all of these sessions and they're going to be available on the Tualatin SWCD YouTube channel. So if you've missed something in the past and want to go back to it, um, they are up on YouTube. We are going to have Kristen present until about 6.50, and then we're saving 10 minutes for Q&A. So all of the questions will be held till the end. Um, there, at the bottom of your screen, there's both a chat box and a Q&A box. So all the questions, dump them into that Q&A, and I'll be monitoring those. If you see a question that somebody else asks that you like, um, there's a little thumbs up. So you can, you can click that to indicate that it's one that's a high priority question, because we probably will not get to all of them. Um, but Kristen has been very generous in offering up her contact info at the end of the presentation. So if you have a question that doesn't get covered, you can contact her directly. All right, so to introduce today's presenter, Kristen Tripp is a research microbiologist with the USDA Agricultural Research Service. She works in the Forage Seed and Cereal Research Unit in Corvallis, and um, her interests include soil restoration, soil health, microbial ecology, and natural product development. She's a board member of the U.S. Biochar Initiative. She's a past chair of the Soil Biology Biochemistry Division of the Soil Science Society of America. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> she, she curates the Pacific Northwest Biochar Atlas. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, and good evening. Um, I don't know what the weather's like up in the Portland area, but down here in Corvallis, it's a beautiful night. So I really appreciate you taking time out of your evening uh, to join us. Um, and thanks uh, to Charlotte for inviting me. Um, as she said, I'm a research microbiologist for the USDA. And one of the things that I study in my lab is the agricultural and environmental use of biochar, a soil amendment that has gained quite a bit of popularity over the last decade or so. Oh, hang on, there we go. Um, but before we begin talking about biochar, I just want to go over some basic ideas about how you might go about looking at your soil to identify where it's deficient, where you might be able to make some improvements. Um, I'll talk about soil amendment in general to help you identify the right product for your soil needs. And then I'll talk a bit about biochar basics. And together we can talk about whether or not biochar will improve your soil and help you meet your soil health goals or your agronomic goals. Um, but I just want to step back for a minute and talk about soil health. Um, and even before we get to that, I want to identify um, and define what health is. So according to the World Health Organization, health is a state of complete well-being. And there's several components of that, including physical, mental, and um, social well-being. And so it's not just the absence of disease or infirmary. And so to determine whether or not you're healthy, um, you can go through this qualitative uh, and a quantitative assessment. So a qualitative assessment could just be you asking yourself some questions. Um, so for example, 
Do you have chronic pain? Do you exercise? Do you drink excessive amounts of alcohol? Is your diet well balanced? Um, do you oftentimes feel anxious? Um, and do you have social and emotional support? And if you honestly answer these questions, um, you can do a preliminary assessment that can indicate your general well being. So if you answer uh, these questions um, in the negative or in the affirmative, you can get some ideas about how you're doing. Um, but you can also uh, perform a quantitative assessment that would likely involve working with a doctor or an MD to perform laboratory tests or do some sort of imaging, um, for example, to measure the function of your organs. And then you work with that doctor to, um, uh, to interpret the results of that task within that relationship so that you can start to make some changes, either by incorporating long-term changes into your lifestyle or by having some sort of an acute uh, intervention, uh, whether or not that's you know a, a surgery or taking a specific medication. Now, in a lot of ways, soil health is really similar to these concepts we've been talking about in human health. Um, soil health is defined by the national uh, uh, resource, uh, uh, the NRCS, as the continued capacity of soil to function as a living, vital ecosystem that sustains plants and animals um, and human uh, and humans um, uh, and humans. Uh, soil health, like human health, is made up of different components, including uh, biological, uh, biological, physical, and chemical uh, components. Again, like human health, you can measure it through a qualitative and through quantitative measurements. So for example, um, quantitative measurements can just, again, be sort of the questions that we talked about earlier. You know, does your soil blow or float away? Does water soak in quickly or does it pool after a rainstorm? Um, does your soil crust? Do your crops uh, recover the nutrients you applied? So when you put fertilize the fertilizer down on your crops, you actually um, do the plants actually take that up and, and utilize those nutrients? Um, are there areas of your soil where plants grow uh, poorly or do they die? And if you answer these set of questions um, in a specific way, you can tell probably pretty quickly whether or not your soils are healthy. But again, you know, going on this analogy of human health, you can also work with a professional to perform quantitative assessments of soil health. And these can be biological tests um, in terms of, you know, how much biological activity do you have? What's the biomass of those microbes that you have in the soil? Um, is your soil fertile? Um, you can have the pH of your soil tested to make sure that it's compatible with the plants that you're growing. Um, you can perform chemical tests to look at macro and micro plant nutrients. Um, and then you can perform physical tests as well to look at things like soil aggregation and compaction. Um, and then you work with an expert to interpret these results. Um, and then just like human health, you can either incorporate long-term changes into your management practices or you can perform an acute intervention. Now, I know that you guys have had some talks on soil health, so I'm not gonna belabor these points, but um, some of the long-term changes that you might incorporate to improve soil health would be to maximize uh, your root armor, to maximize your cover through cover cropping, to minimize disturbance by not tilling, to maximize biodiversity by having um, a range of plants that you're growing on that soil, and to integrate livestock into your cropping um, system. Um, so that's, but another way to incorporate or to improve the health of your soil is through an acute intervention, um, usually in the form of soil amendments. These amendments can increase soil carbon, which of course is the heart of soil health. Um, you can adjust the pH, you can add nutrients, and you can modify the soil texture. Now over the weekend, I went with my husband to our local garden center and I walked around um, the soil amendment section and I am always just so amazed um, and, and sort of shocked to see, um, first of all, the price of these amendments, but also just the sheer diversity of them that are available for performing this sort of acute intervention. They range from lime to manure to microbial inoculants um, to compost plants. But the one thing that they all have in common is that almost none of these tell you exactly what you're adding to your soil or provide you any sort of realistic expectation 
on the outcome of their use. And so if there's one thing I'd really like you to walk away from this talk today is that in order to have the best outcome with any soil amendment is that you have to match your soil deficiencies to the attributes of um, the amendment. And this is especially true with biochar. So uh, when I'm talking about soil amendments, I can be talking really about three categories, fertilizers, uh, soil amendments, and mulch. Now, um, I put a star by fertilizer to remind me that unlike soil amendments and mulch, uh, which tend to be uh, used in, um, uh, which tend to be low in or, or sometimes even negative in nutrient content and used at high application rates, fertilizers are really high in nutrients and are, uh, are used in smaller amounts. Um, one benefit of inorganic fertilizers is that they're regulated. And so you can look at the bag and you can see how much nitrogen, how much phosphorus, and how much potassium um, are in each of these bags. And so you can really easily do that. You can really easily pair the needs of your plant with the amendment, with the um, amount of fertilizer that's on the bag. Soil amendments are a bit more nebulous and nebulous in their contents. And so it's harder to figure out which one could benefit your cropping system. Now, like I said, um, there's uh, lots of different soil amendments that are available, but we can sort them into different categories. Uh, there's organic amendments, and by organic, I mean that they primarily consist of carbon. Um, these include manures and composts. Um, and by adding high carbon products, you can improve nutrient release, you can improve soil structure, you can decrease your bulk density of your soil, which can improve water uptake, and of course, uh, because they're rich in carbon, they also provide a lot of um, food for microbes to consume. Uh, Manure-based amendments obviously also contain a lot of plant macronutrients. Inorganic amendments like uh, lime and perlite can improve pH um, and decrease the bulk density of the soil. And then there's biochar, which is sort of the ultimate organic carbon amendment. But while biochar can provide some of the benefits of organic uh, amendments, it can also act as a lining agent. And so I'd like to spend um, some time talking about biochar, what it is, uh, how it works, and then we'll talk about how potentially you can use it to uh, help improve uh, your soil and your crops. So what is biochar? Um, the most direct and broad definition of biochar is that it's charcoal that's added to the soil. And usually uh, we use this in the context of agriculture or in environmental remediation. Um, biochar is different from fly ash or paper mill waste because the key to biochar is that it's produced in the absence of oxygen. So, um, Unlike ash, uh, it, the carbon that's within the feedstock is not completely combusted. So they leave these dense um, carbon structures, I'll go back just for a minute, these dense carbon structures which can be quite functional in the soil. Now biochar can be made at really any scale. You can make it in your backyard in one of these kilns, um, or it can be made at a really large industrial plant like this one in southern Oregon that also produces energy. Um, for the power grid along with biochar. So I don't know, maybe about 25 years ago, there was this really large and renewed interest in the use of charcoal by indigenous people to improve soil fertility. Now here I'm showing this really well-known photo of the terra preta soils in the Amazon basin where indigenous uh, people would burn wood and human waste and then they would bury it. These soils, which are normally these sort of weathered oxisols, um, very infertile soils, um, became quite productive from this practice. And you can see how dark these soils became over um, you know, decades and, and centuries and, um, and millennia. Um, and although the terra um, preta soils are best known examples of ancient cultures using charcoal to improve soil fertility, the same practice is found in Australia, in Asia, in Europe, and in North America. For example, here is a photo of a mollusol in Iowa 
that contains up to 50% charcoal from historic prairie burning events uh, from Native Americans. And to this day, these amended soils, whether they're in Australia, Iowa, or in uh, the Amazon basin, they're much more productive uh, than their nearby unamended soils. So this uh, sort of observation that these soils with charcoal are, are so much more productive has really just spurred this interest in what we now call biochar. And scientists have just immersed themselves in figuring out why charcoal and specifically charcoal mixed with other organic amendments has such a profound impact on soil health and fertility. And we've learned a lot about the nature of biochar and the benefits that it can confer. So um, we've learned that biochar is very persistent, that it can increase the amount of water and nutrients that you have in the soil, that it can help control plant diseases, um, that it increases pH, and that it binds organic pollutants and pesticides. And biochar can accomplish all of these things because of this very intricate structure that's left from the feedstock. When the feedstock's burned, uh, it leaves behind this carbon skeleton that's incredibly stable and has an enormous amount of surface areas and pores. These pores can hold water and depending on the size of the pore, can release that water back to plants. Um, if we take a look at this molecular structure of uh, biochar, you can see that it's made up of these very dense carbon rings that are just carbon, carbon, carbon bonds. Uh, these rings are very stable and they're resistant to microbial degradation. So the charcoal can last hundreds, if not thousands of years in the soil. But on the surface of the biochar molecule, you start to have these ox oxygen functional groups. And as these oxygen functional groups start to break down, um, they can interact with nutrients, with pesticides, with signals from microbes that can confer these other properties that I'm talking about. So as the biochar ages, uh, the molecules become more reactive and you can actually form a coating on the surface that allows the charcoal to interact with molecules and microbes to help plants grow. Some of these other pro pro properties like uh, increasing pH or directly provisioning nutrients comes from the inherent properties of the feedstocks and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So how does this compare to other organic member amendments like compost? Well, it's really quite similar, to be honest. But the big difference is that biochar and the effects of biochar can last um, a very, very long time. Plus, biochar can have um, multiple effects, whereas, say, compost might be adding, um, adding nutrients and adding carbon. Uh, biochar can do all those things and it can also uh, have a liming effect. So, so biochar tends to be a little bit more additive than some of these other amendments. So the next question is, um, how can you harness as a grower some of the benefits of biochar? And to sort of skip to the punchline, uh, it's that in order to get the most benefit from biochar or for any soil amendment is that you have to identify cropping goals you have to identify products that can address those goals and that you have to use those products at a rate that makes sense. Now, if you're familiar with the principles of applying soil nutrients through inorganic fertilizer, this might sound a lot like the four R's, right? The right rate, the right place, the right source, and the right time. And these four R's are uh, important for correctly utilizing fertilizer. Similarly, using biochar to improve soil health and increase crop yields requires similar thought. So what I'd like to do is talk about why we need to pick the right biochar, and then uh, I'll show you a decision support tool that we've crafted specifically for biochar. And then I'll show you some results from some studies we've done to demonstrate sort of the outcome of that process. Um, and so, uh, let's start talking about uh, the right source. So something I said earlier um, that I'd like to reiterate is that biochar comes in many shapes and sizes. Um, there's many processes that produce charcoal. Um, this can include black carbon from forest fires, um, activated charcoal to purify water. It includes soot and ash. 
But in reality, biochar is all of these things. Um, if we look at the particle level and, and sort of break it down, the vast majority of a biochar particle is stable carbon that can react with the surrounding water to pro, you know, provide this fertility, to absorb water, to increase cation exchange, um, and to bind environmental toxins. But a biochar particle also has volatile carbon, which can um, you know, provide nutrients for microbes. It can have an ash component that can contribute potassium, calcium, um, and phosphorus to depleted soils. But not all biochars are alike. So here we've got some biochars that are made from three different feedstocks, hazelnuts, juniper, and poultry litter pellets, um, or chicken manure. And uh, you can see that they all look very different at the macro scale. But if you look at the micro scale on the molecular level, they're also really different. So if we just compare the poultry litter to the hazelnut as an example, you can see that hazelnut has a lot more stable carbon than the poultry litter. litter. Um, uh, and uh, which is really good for carbon sequestration, but the poultry litter has more ash, which can provide more soil fertility. Um, but it even gets more complicated. So as we increase the production temperatures, so say that we compare, you know, a poultry litter that char that's produced at 300 degrees Celsius versus one that's uh, produced at 700 degrees Celsius, you can see that the different components of the poultry litter change and you tend to have more ash um, and less volatile carbon as the volatile carbon burns off. In comparison to that, we've got the hazelnut where you just really um, tend to increase the stable carbon fraction um, and decrease the volatile carbon. But this has a really profound impact on the molecular properties of the char and in turn significantly impacts the way that the char interacts with the soil to provide fertilizer values. So for example here, um, you can see that, and I actually can't see it because um, our pictures are covering it up, but that's okay. Um, as you can see here, the poultry litter um, tends to have more fertilizer value than the hazelnut char, um, while and also has more liming value because it has this extra ash component in it. So what I'm showing here is a, is a really small amount of the components of biochar, right? So I'm just looking at volatile carbon, stable col uh, carbon, and the ash component. There's probably 20 or other 30 um, properties of biochar that we can evaluate in a similar fashion that um, you know control uh, how much water your biochar is going to hold, um, what the particle size is, how it's going to uh, affect the, the microbes in the soil. And so it's really important that when you choose a biochar, you choose one that has um, uh, um, similar properties. So um, like I said, you know, just focusing on those three properties, uh, stable, volatile, uh, stable and volatile carbon and ash content, you know, if we look at a wider range of biochar instead of just looking at those two, and we look at ash content, the fixed carbon and the volatile matter, you can see that these feedstocks and these different temperatures that they're produced at really do change the components. So for example, if we just look at this dug fir, um, and, it, and we increase the temperature, you can see that the volatile matter decreases and the amount of ash increases. So this has, you know, um, uh, the intent is just to show you that there's 34 biochars on this, um, on this slide and, and they all just range so differently in just these three properties. So given that there's just sort of this infinite possibility based on various feedstocks and production conditions, how can farmers um, decide which char to use? Um, um, because again, you know, the, the sort of take home point is that you really need to pair the attributes of the amendment with the deficiencies in the soil. So to help farmers make this decision, we devised a decision support tool um, to, to, uh, to help them. Um, an important first step in creating the decision support tool was to use a classification system that was developed by the International Biochar Initiative to describe biochars. 
um, our decision to uh, our decision support tool is based on this system. So I just want to point out a few aspects of it. So this uh, system describes the biochar's agricultural impact in four areas. The ability of a biochar to provide long-term carbon storage, um, its ability to provide um, plant nutrients or fertilizer class, its ability to neutralize soil acidity or liming class, and the particle size of the biochar, which likely influences soil water retention and infiltration. This uh, system provides a basis for comparing biochar so a user could make an informed decision about selecting the most appropriate biochar for their application. So this classification system gives a quantitative prediction of the impact biochar would have on a soil. For instance, if we just look at fertilizer class uh, for this label, the number four shows that it has high concentrations of four nutrients in plant extractable forms, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and magnesium. The subscript here shows that, for example, a two ton per acre application rate of biochar would provide sufficient extractable um, potassium and phosphorus to meet the demand of a corn crop, while a five ton application um, would provide sufficient sulfur and a three ton application uh, would provide significant uh, sufficient magnesium. What this suggests is that if you know a crop's nutrient requirements um, and any crop, it doesn't necessarily need to be corn, you could apply the right amount of biochar, perhaps in combination with other nutrient sources uh, to meet crop demand. Uh, similarly, if you have a target pH that you need to adjust the soil to, you could calculate the amount of biochar needed to make that adjustment. So, our tool is called uh, the Pacific Northwest Biochar Atlas. It's available at that website. And actually, I'm going to pop out of my uh, slide presentation in a minute. I'm going to go to the website to show you it. Um, expands on the classification system by comparing the nutrient and lime equivalents of biochar to the requirement of a large number of crops. So let me get out of here. I'll stop that share. And then I'll see if I can do that. Um, let's see if this works. Um, oh yeah. Okay. So, aha. Okay. Can everybody see that? Looks good, Kristen. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So this is on the homepage of the Atlas. And when you scroll down, you get a number of options that a lot of these are just educational. So you can go and find out, you know, what biochar is. Um, learn about some of the benefits of char, learn how to make it. Um, we've got a bunch of case studies on the site. You can explore the user tools, which is what we're going to do in just a second. And then you can find biochar producers uh, within the Pacific Northwest. And so there's a list of tools that we have here, the Soil Data Explorer, um, uh, Cost Benefit, and then we'll, we'll go through a couple of these. So, like I said, the first sort of um, barrier to getting the most out of your soil amendment is to find out where, what your soils are deficient in. And so what we've set up is sort of a Google map based systems where you can punch in an address and, and find out about your soil. And this is based off of the NRCS um, soil web. So it, it's really similar. So here I just punched in the address where I'm at right now, which is my office on the Oregon State campus. Um, and it'll go there and We'll just choose the dairy farm. Actually, let me choose somewhere else. Let me choose, um, I don't know whose field this is, but we're going to pick their field. Let's see. Yeah, here, let me pick one side. Let's go around. Here we go. Let's pick this field here. So this is in a Bashaw clay. It's non-flooded. It's not slopey. So it'll give you the soil series and some information about the soil classes. Um, it'll also give you physical properties of the soil um, in terms of its texture. Um, it's predicted organic matter and it's bulk density. It'll tell you some of the moisture properties that you have um, here in terms of what you, uh, the amount of water it's expected to hold. And then it'll also give you some chemical, um, some chemical properties. Now, um, the, I'm trying to, there we go. So, um, so once you kind of scroll through here and you learn about, so for example, the pH of your soil, this is a really good one for us uh, to look at. We can go ahead and, and launch a tool that'll help us select a biochar um, 
to meet some of our crabbing goals. And so I'm going to open this up in a new window. Here we go. And then it'll give you some directions. But we're just going to get started. Now it's going to ask you to provide as much information as possible um, about your soils. Now you can either go to a soil testing lab and directly input um, some values, or you can use uh, the information that we just had on the Soil Explorer map. So we're just going to populate this from where I went. Um, I know that I've got some potassium in my soils. Uh, the Sergo database generally doesn't include fertility data. So I'm just going to put some numbers in here. Um, I'm going to say that I've got 100 ppm potassium. Um, my pH is 5.6. That all makes sense. And so now we're going to view an interpretation of these data and find out where my soil is lacking. Okay, so um, this is great. So um, it'll tell me um, about the carbon amounts, fertility, acidity, and moisture. And we'll scroll through these together. So um, according to uh, the Sergo, I have a lot of organic carbon in my soils. Um, I think that it said I had 5.6% or, or over 5%, which is really high. It, it's sort of abnormal, but that's great, right? Um, so I, I know I don't need to add biochar to increase my carbon. Um, and then it'll walk you through a fertility analysis. And to do that, you can select a crop. So let's pick a crop um, that's you know mid to high value, that's commonly grown in um, Oregon. Let's see if one is that I can find that's sort of fun to look at. Um, let's pick sweet corn. Okay, so um, according, if I pick sweet corn, it'll tell me that my phosphorus levels are too low to grow sweet corn and that my potassium levels are also really low. Um, if I go to the next uh, tab, which is acidity, um, it'll tell me that my acidity is really low. So I know that um, my acidity, according to um, uh, the Soil Explorer, was, uh, I think it was, let's see, 5.6. Um, that's really on, on the very low end of the spectrum to grow uh, corn. And so, oh, it tells me right there, 5.6, which is, again, near the lower limit of what's recommended for corn. And so this will tell me how many uh, tons of biochar I need to increase my uh, soil to uh, 6.0 or 6.4. And they've got values for Western Oregon and values for Eastern Oregon. We can then go to moisture. And, and this is a little bit less informative because quite honestly, there's not a lot you can do to change the moisture properties of your soil, um, but it'll at least give you that information. And then next we're gonna choose, uh, knowing that we're gonna choose some biochar goals. So I know that the, um, the explorer told me that I need to increase my soil pH and that I need to increase uh, phosphorus and I need to increase potassium. All of those things are lacking in my soil for the crop that I've chosen. And so um, it will tell me, uh, give me some recommendations, right? So um, to help me choose biochar. So I've already chosen my goals and now the system will evaluate those goals and pick some biochar for me. So for priority one, which is increasing soil pH, out of all the biochars we have at the back end of the system, we've got about two dozen biochars. It's telling me to pick a biochar made from poultry litter pellets, um, somewhere between five and 700 degrees or an Oregon white oak. These have a lot of liming value and calcium carbonate equivalents. My second priority was to increase phosphorus. Again, it's telling me that I should use something with a high ash content, something like poultry litter pellets and the same thing for potassium. And then in the end, uh, it will go through and it'll uh, rank my priorities and tell me that poultry litter pellets at 500 degrees will probably be uh, the best biochar that I could add to my soil to meet my cropping goals. <clears throat> and then it'll give me some ideas on amendment rates. So if I wanna use uh, poultry litter, I can scroll down here from all of these different choices and it'll tell me how many uh, tons per acre I need to uh, to add to reach these equivalents. Okay, and so, um, and again, uh, by crop, we can do the same thing. So lastly, I mean, this all makes sense. It looks like these biochars could really help me um, grow better corn, 
Um, but in the end, is it going to make sense for my cropping system? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the um, cost benefit analysis tool. Um, again, it'll give me some instructions. I want US units. Um, and it'll ask me how many, how much biochar I want to add. Now, if I go back to, I'm sorry, if I go back to here, it was telling me that I probably need to add um, between one and two tons per acre. So that's what we're going to pick. We're going to pick, we're going to go high. We're going to go to two tons an acre. Um, I've talked to my biochar supplier and he's going to tell me that I can get biochar for about $250 a ton. Um, and then I can look at crop values. So um, I just looked this up before I came and I know that corn is going, fresh corn uh, to the frozen market is going for about $100 a ton. Um, and my average yield is about, um, uh, let's just say 100 tons per acre. If I add biochar and I can expect a 10% you know, um, change in yields, um, I can get fancy and change some of the crop inputs. And then at the end, it'll tell me what my expected um, outcome is. So here, um, if I um, you know, have a, a large increase in corn yield, you can see that I can have quite a big impact per acre on something seems wrong there. Oh, no, no that's right. Oh, that's right. That I can have a, a rather large uh, uh, impact on my crop yields. But this isn't true um, for all of um, all of the uh, crops and all the soils that we have. And so I'm going to stop sharing here and go back to my slide presentation. Let's see if this will work. Share screen. Let's go back here. Okay. Um, Okay, so I want to tell you about a study we did up in, uh, in uh, northern Washington near Spokane. So the Gady family is from Rockford, Washington. They've been farming their land for 70 years. And like many uh, wheat growers and grass seed growers, they grow a variety of rotational crops, including Kentucky bluegrass and oats and wheat and canola. Um, when field birding was phased out in the 1990s, uh, Larry Gady, who owns his farm, was concerned that he'd have all this extra residue laying around his farm that he couldn't burn. So he wanted to get rid of it. And simultaneously, electricity prices were rising. So he had this idea that he could build an on-farm gasifier that could take straw and turn it into electricity to feed the rural grid. And he obtained funding to build this research-grade gasifier, which is, uh, which is shown right here. Um, of course, by the time, you know, the gas fire was built and running, energy prices had plummeted and straw prices were good. So it didn't really make sense to take all of his straw and feed it into this gas fire to produce cheap electricity. But what about this other stuff it, it produced, which was biochar? Um, did it have value? Uh, Larry wanted to know if he could use, you know, his straw or use other on-farm residues like uh, seed tailings to power the machine. And the answer to his question was a resounding yes. Um, uh, he could use his biochar to improve uh, soils on their farm and soils on adjacent farm. Now, like many soils in the Northern Palouse, the Gady soil is becoming extremely acidified from the use of synthetic fertilizers. On the Gady farm, it's not unusual to measure uh, soil pH at around three, four, um, which is not very conducive to growing wheat. Uh, and mainly because that crop is susceptible to aluminum toxicity. And there's a lot of aluminum in those soils. And at those low pHs, the aluminum moves into the plant and kills it. But at the same time, there's not a local source for lime. So it's cost prohibitive uh, to lime the soil. But will the biochar they produce from um, their on-farm gasifier help? To answer these questions, we set up a field experiment, um, and the goal was to use biochar to raise the pH from, uh, from about 3.5 to 5. To achieve this, we added the equivalent of 8 tons per acre of biochar, which is a lot. Um, it's 1% uh, by weight, and that's sort of a typical amount you see in a field experiment. As a comparison, we added an equal amount of lime, um, which is ca calcium carbonate equivalents of 1 ton per acre, and we had an unamended control. 
and then we tilled it all in to about 10 centimeters. And we saw really impressive results. So um, the pH of the soil was increased. You can see that here. So it went from about four um, up to five in the lime and a little bit less in the biochar. For some reason, my, uh, my legend's not showing up. So black is biochar, white is the control, and gray is, is the lime. Um, um, we saw a significant increase in the amount of yield of wheat. So um, in the lime plots, we saw that we doubled our yield. And in the biochar plots, we tripled our yield. And you can see those results here. So this is without biochar, and this is with biochar, uh, probably in May. Um, and so while lime helped a change uh, by changing the pH, um, and decrease in the aluminum, it doesn't completely explain the dramatic yield increase we saw with biochar. But there is a, a pretty big caveat. Um, the gaities could potentially do this across their farm or in areas that are is, uh, especially acidic because they run the gasifier and they produce the biochar at a very low cost. But what if they had to buy it? So going back to the cost benefit analysis that we did earlier and punching in the numbers for eight tons an acre and the prices of wheat, with a 300% increase, even with a 300% increase in yield, um, you can see that you don't make your money back, even after five years. So if this doesn't work in wheat, uh, what crops would it work in? So just, we did a quick economic analysis and asked at $500 a hectare and a 10% increase in yield, which crops would make money? Um, and the answer is really limited to high value crops like potatoes, um, field crops like wheat, hay, alfalfa um, would not be able to uh, afford biochar. Um, if you were in the organic market and you were at really high prices or in a crop like hops, you could actually, um, you could afford a price that's about 500 or five times this amount in biochar and still take home um, and still make a profit. But the take home is that really only high value crops can bear the cost of biochar amendments at this point. Um, just moving out of field crops for a minute, you can see that that's true in, in grapes, um, in hops, uh, blueberries, you can make lots of money. Um, if, even with small increases in yield, you can realize, um, you can realize profits with biochar. But again, um, uh, in order to be profitable, you really need to um, optimize using biochar, test your soil, find the deficiency, work with a supplier to identify um, an appropriate contact and at a scale that makes sense. And I just want to go back to this idea of soil health and, and reiterate that point in that, you know, if um, you go to a, 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 an MD with a health problem, um, you, would, you would have an acute intervention that made sense for that problem. And so that's exactly the point that I'm trying to drive home in soil health is that you really need to work with an expert to um, interpret your soil test results, to um, find out where your deficiencies are, and then find an acute intervention that works with you. Um, so, so again, optimizing the use of biochar, you know, finding the problem that you're trying uh, to solve, uh, with soil testing, working with suppliers to identify uh, products that are compatible. And then I would also encourage you all to be early adopters of biochar, um, but do it at a small scale that makes economic sense uh, for you. And again, here's that website with the um, information for um, the tools that I showed you. And this is my contact information. And with that, I am happy to take questions. I think we have lots of time. Awesome, thank you so much, Kristen. It's always hard with webinars that you don't get the applause at the end, but just, just imagine. Um, and yeah, it's great that we have ended a little bit early because there are eight questions in the queue and there might be a few more that come in. Um, so we'll just get as, through as many as we can um, before seven o'clock. So first question from Jim uh, with a couple upvotes. Is the ash or charcoal from my wood fire in the backyard fire pit biochar? How about ash from my barbecue grill? What's the difference in the outdoor kiln you referenced in making biochar? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, thank you for asking it. So, um, so 
the charcoal in your grill that you would use for your grill is obviously a little different. When you know Kingsford or um, one of the big companies makes charcoal, they add a lot of products to it. So it's not just a natural soil amendment. When that burns down to ash, it's actually not biochar. It's ash at that point. And most of the and the, and the big difference that I don't think I drove home was that when you produce biochar, you do it in the absence of oxygen. And so you don't get that complete combustion. Um, it's kind of like when you build a campfire and at the end of the night, you have those big chunky, um, you know, logs that just didn't completely combust. And so when they have the kiln that I showed you, it's shaped in a pyramid. And what that does is it draws down the air from the top. And so um, it's always drawing in on itself. And so what that does is it just provides a partial combustion. And so um, while the ash that's in your fireplace probably is useful for bringing up the pH of your soil, it's probably you know not useful for conferring those other benefits, um, especially with carbon. It will provide some nutrients though, um, including potassium, uh, calcium, and, um, uh, and, and, and likely some phosphorus. Great, thank you. All right, next question. Um, I remember that while the regulations for the USDA National Organic Program were being debated in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a strong resistance from those in the so-called organic community to allowing the use of biochar by certified organic growers. Why was that? You know, back um, when, when biochar first sort of became being explored, it, it, they were really making it out of whatever they could find. And so there were some more unscrupulous folks who were making it out of things like tires, rubber, um, you know, waste products that we, we couldn't really say that this was safe for your garden or safe for your crops. And so um, if, if you're making it out of wood products, it should be completely safe. Um, if you're making it out of poultry litter, it should be completely safe. But if you're making it out of tires, nobody wants to take that responsibility. And I think that's where a lot of the resistance was from. Yeah, so lacking the bio part of biochar. Yeah. All right, our next question. Um, can you address the potential use of biochar for a home kitchen garden in raised beds? You know, um, yes. I think th it's interesting to me uh, you know, there's this saying that you hear a lot is that you don't need to gild the lily, right? And most of our home garden beds are, you know, you, you, the first thing you do is you, is you make this beautiful soil. You go out and you buy soil from, you know, a local provider that's um, already added lots of nutrients to it. Um, it's, it's really rare that you're using a soil that's depleted. Um, and so I'm not sure that you need to add biochar to a soil that's like that. If, if you have soil and it has a specific problem, um, you can go through that sort of quantitative assessment that I provided. Are your plants not taking in nutrients? Is your soil crusting? Um, is soil running off or is water running out of your soils um, uh, off the surface? If the answer to that question is yes, then you have a deficiency that, that you can address perhaps with biochar, um, perhaps with compost, um, perhaps with a different amendment, but um, but most of the home gardens I see are, are pretty nice soil. And so um, I, I'm always, you know, taken aback when I walk into the garden center and I'm like, wow, that's like a $35 bag that's this big of an amendment that you're going to put into a garden that's, that's already really nice. So I, I would caution home gardeners in saying that, you know, you're probably over, um, you could be over fertilizing your, your plants. Great, thank you. So the next question, I think you touched on it in your first answer, but I'm gonna read it anyway in case it sparks any other thoughts. Um, I recall being told that you don't want to use much ash at all. In fact, it isn't really good to use. I see that biochar has a lot more carbon. Is ash burned more completely? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly why what the difference is between biochar and ash. I will say that ash has its place, especially if you've got acidic soils um, and you're having a hard time bringing the pH up. Um, through lime. Ash will do that for you really nicely. Great. All right. We're doing good on time and we've got five more questions so far. We keep adding on. All right. So um, this one is more of a statement. And so if you have a response to it, that'd be 
of interest. Um, getting crop residue off the field is an outdated approach. Leaving it there is an important dimension of no-till production, which has multiple well-documented soil health and conservation benefits. From a CO2 perspective, I can't see why it makes sense to remove the residue and use fossil fuels to turn it into biochar and release all that carbon into the atmosphere. Yeah. I think that's a great point, and I couldn't agree with you more. You know, the, the in Oregon, the vast majority of our char is made from forest products. And so um, if you think about, uh, especially in Southern Oregon um, and, and in these overstocked forests where you have a lot of slash, um, it makes absolute sense from a carbon balance to take that wood and instead of putting it in a slash pile where it's going to go is to take it and turn it into biochar. When you take, um, and, and I can't say this for poultry litter or some of the other ways because the conversions are a little different, but for wood, you can take up to 50% of the carbon that's in that wood and sequester it in biochar. And when you burn it, all that goes to the atmosphere. So, um, so in terms of business as usual comparisons, um, I would not advocate taking straw and turning it into biochar, but I would advocate for taking waste wood and low value products that are gonna be um, burned anyway and turn those into biochar. And, and that's where the vast majority of our biochar is going. Um, the Gady Farm's a little different. Um, they, they're, they're not using straw anymore. Um, like I said, um, the straw market is pretty hot. And, and even if you disagree with the, the straw market, I think there's, there's um, a, a conversation uh, to have with farmers about removing residue at all. But um, they're using uh, seed cleanings from their uh, seed production business. So when you, uh, when you uh, grow seeds, you have to make sure that they're pure. And so they're burning all of their extra seeds that um, would just otherwise, again, be, uh, be, uh, be burned in piles or sold as silage. Great, thank you. Can you speak to the effects of biochar in forests? We've heard that small biochar making units taken out in the field could be a good solution to reducing fuels in forests and when thinning or pruning trees near homes. Absolutely. So uh, these kilns um, that I was uh, that I showed in my presentation and that I mentioned, they're very portable. They're very easy to learn to use. Um, and they're really easy to make biochar with. And so um, Kelpie Wilson, who is uh, um, sort of a, a biochar expert who lives in Southern Oregon, this is really what she's proposing. And there's a lot of legislation right now that actually um, is asking to do this in Congress to sort of form these uh, conservation cores that would go out and use these uh, kilns to produce biochar in the forest as a way to sequester carbon, not only from reduction of burning, but also by sequestering soil carbon once it's put into the ground. And so um, they're not looking to take that biochar that's produced and then sell it to farmers. They're looking to produce the biochar and leave it in the woods where it can do things like uh, increase water holding capacity and buffer the soil. Great. All right, if a fuel reduction program macerates downed, wood, downed branches and logs, will the resulting ground up stuff be appropriate to turn into biochar? So um, I've seen, uh, I've seen um, different sized chips be made into biochar. I think the best, uh, and it depends also on, on the size of the uh, production unit that you're using, but um, in my experience, the best, you know, wood is kind of like small diameter wood um, that's about this long, um, but we've used wood that's, that's really high. What doesn't work really well is um, chipped wood. So macerated wood is okay, but not chipped. Um, chipped bur wood burns really quickly and goes to ash. Um, so um, I think that, I'm not sure if that answered your question. Sounds like it. From my reading it, it did, but if the person who asked that question has a follow-up, you're welcome to type that into the chat or the Q&A box, and I'll read that. Um, the next question was submitted when you were showing a slide that showed a couple different sources, was comparing a few different sources of biochar and uh, referencing hazelnut. So they're asking whether that was hazelnut shells or wood or, or what was that? It was shells. Very cool. Yeah. Hazelnut shells are actually really fun to make biochar out of. All right, and so this is the last question in the queue. Um, we're doing great on time. And so if there are any others that get submitted while um, I read this one, we can handle it, but um, this, 
it's looking great. So I'm interested in using biochar to reduce the need to irrigate my blueberries, but don't need my current pH of 5.6 to be further increased. How do I go about selecting the best bio biochar to meet this need? That's a great question. So we've actually done a study in blueberries um, here, and I didn't mention it today. Um, and uh, I think the, the so it sounds like you're talking about an existing blueberry uh, field. And so all the work that we've done has been in new plantings of blueberries, or which is going to be a little bit different. But we were really concerned about that too, right? Because um, e blueberry growers are even worried about adding compost because compost has a high pH. And so, um, and because blueberries are so sensitive to pH, the last thing that you want to do is mess with it. And so we were really concerned about this and we added biochar at a really high rate. We added it at 20% in the planting hole, which is big. That's, that's a lot of biochar. And um, interestingly enough, we used a wood biochar from um, the, the, actually the big power plant that I showed. It's uh, called, um, and it's commercially available. It's called Rogue Biochar. And the pH of that biochar is about 10. But the cool thing about it is that it has a really low calcium carbonate equivalence. And so it doesn't actually lime the soils very well. And so what I would encourage somebody to do who's concerned about changing the pH of their soil is to do a quick test at home um, with a pH meter we can get these pH meters pretty cheap on Amazon, um, you know, 13 to $20. You can get some of your soil, mix it in with biochar, water it, and then see how the soil changes. Um, if you're using something that has a high pH but a low calcium carbonate equivalence, it's possible that you won't have that big of an effect on pH. And that's what we saw in our studies. Whereas something that has like a really high ash content like poultry, um, litter biochar would have a really big impact on pH. And I would not recommend using that at all. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you to all of the attendees who spent time with us this evening. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that this is being recorded and all of our, our other Soil School sessions have been recorded and will be available on the Tualatin SWCB website. And um, sorry, on YouTube, we're loading them onto YouTube. Um, and yeah, Kristen, thank you for providing your contact info. If folks have follow-up questions, reach out to Kristen. She's a great local resource. And then um, if any of you in Washington County or in the West Multnomah um, region have questions for your SWCD, go ahead and visit our websites. Um, and there are, we have lots of resources that we can help folks out with. So thank you to everyone again for um, attending. And I'm seeing somebody ask for your contact info. So I will make sure to put that into the chat before I actually close out this session. But thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody. <laughs> thank you.